Welcome to the Chapter 12 mini lecture. This lecture will be replacing your in-class lecture for this week. Um, before we get started, I will warn you that this is going to be a relatively informal lecture as compared to some of my other online lectures for some of my online courses. Um, we discussed the resource, uh, human resource wheel in class um, and basically what this wheel shows. This shows all the organizational functions and activities that, that uh, human resources actually um, handles for a company. They, they, they are much more oriented now toward productivity and quality, um, innovation, HR fulfillment, and uh, preparing the company for change than, um, than they have been in prior decades. Now, we did not go into too much discussion on orientation and orientation programs. Um, basically, a, an orientation is a day or two or maybe even three days that are set aside by the employer in the initial days of employment to really handle a complete introduction to new employees. It's going to also include introducing them to their departments and in some cases even to their jobs. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying, you know, already when a person comes in to start a new job, they're already nervous. So by putting them through an orientation process, it kind of levels the playing field and it gives them additional information about the company that they might not ordinarily receive until much later in their employment. Um, so it reduces the employee's level of stress. Uh, it also, because it's a fixed process, uh, there's lower startup cost associated with an employee. I mean, if every employee that comes into the company is going to need a benefits password and a retirement password and a systems password, they're going to need um, pass cards to get into certain parts of the building, they're going to need um, fingerprint recognition systems, they're going to need doorway entry code access pins. Um, all of this can be handled at one time, handled very productively, and handled by a single department at lower cost. Um, the orientation process is also geared to making sure that employees um, don't end up terminated from the company merely because they didn't understand the policies and procedures relating to their job or relating to the organization. And um, ultimately what we're trying to do is during this uh, two or three day orientation period, we want to um, help the employee to integrate into their department as quickly as possible so that they can become a productive part of the team. And ultimately this all results in the employee being able to um, join their group and um, work in their environment productively in a shorter span of time. So there's two levels of orientation and if you've ever gone to work for a large company you've probably been through at least one of these or both. Um, a general orientation is usually handled by the HR department. Um, it's very um, corporately um, uh, focused, has to do with filling out, you know, uh, non-competition agreements, has to do with preparing you for your benefits, preparing you for um, the policies and procedures of the company and kind of acclimating you to the environment as a whole where the department, the departmental and job orientation deals more with the, uh, d what your specific department and what you're going to be doing um, on a specific job and just like the general orientation is usually handled by the HR department, the departmental orientation is usually handled by the manager of the individual department or maybe even a team leader. So when you're pulling together an orientation kit and you know they call it a kit, it's usually a binder, it might be a human resource introduction brochure or something like that. Um, this is the you know this slide list the kind of information you're going to include in it um, the organizational charts maybe maps to the facility you know if you if you're working for a really huge plant you will probably need a map initially 
a copy of a policies and procedures manual if they have it. Of course you want to know your, your fringe benefits and your holidays. Um, many times they'll go ahead and they'll include your, their, your appraisal forms in your package so that you know what your objectives are or what you should be working toward. Um, in most cases you're going to have to fill out some sort of emergency contact information for a new employer and so they'll also put emergency and accident prevention procedures in there, particularly um, if they are in an industry where there's a high number of accidents or workplace related injuries, uh, this is usually a really, really good time to give a new employee uh, the information they need for accident provision, um, prevention. Um, if there's a newsletter or a magazine or a company store or anything like that, you'll, you may receive a copy of that. Um, you get, you'll get a, some sort of employee directory and usually a copy of any insurance plans that are required. Now, I don't know if you've ever sat through an orientation before, but I certainly have. And at the end of every one of those days, you're just completely exhausted and completely overwhelmed with information. And um, it's quite possible that an employee won't even remember what, um, what they went over in orientation even the second week of employment. Um, a lot of employees um, have complained that there's too much paperwork. I mean, you just, you go from one set of forms to another in the process. Um, and some employees have complained that there's a lot of unnecessary information. I mean, if, if in the general orientation, if there's information about the main headquarters out in Chicago, does a local employee here, do they really care about that? Um, or if, do they really need to know that? Um, so that's one of the things that, you know, that sometimes comes up with handling orientations. Um, a lot of times new employees will feel that the, will feel that companies are trying to oversell themselves, um, that they're selling the organization, that they're trying to, they're trying too hard to build group cohesion. Um, many times the existing employees, once they realize that the orientation process was, was either incorrect, misleading, or ineffective, a lot of times the existing employees won't even respect that orientation process. Um, and that lack of long-term orientation, um, you know, if you have employees that are coming on to the job and they're only going to be working for the summer or six months, you know, it's, it's very hard to, to um, sit through a three-day orientation about longevity at the company. Um, but most orientations, they don't have a long-term focus. They're just trying to get you set up for the day. Um, in a lot of cases, that may be the last time that you talk to the Human Resources par Department because they're not going to um, follow up with you or, or see if you have everything that you need. And this is not, certainly this isn't in every HR department, um, but it can be. Um, and then normally through the orientation, program, it's usually something that's been in place for a long time, and um, companies are not regularly reviewing what they go over in the orientation, and it's not part of the improvement process. Um, when we start talking about um, training, I mean, you know, the main purpose for training an employee is to make sure that they have the skills and the knowledge that they need to do a good job. Um, and that, that does start out with a needs assessment, and that's just a systematic an analysis of the specific training activities that a business requires to achieve its, ex its objectives. Um, so when you're looking at a training program, you're going you're gonna to look at a needs assessment just to determine what you need. Um, you're going to define your, obsess your assessment objectives. You're going to identify necessary data, select data collection methods, gather data, analyze and verify data, and prepare the final report. And, and if you look at these steps, um, these steps apply to so many different things. It's just basically a, a problem solving or improvement model. So there's two types of training objectives. There's the instructional um, objectives. And that includes things like uh, concepts and facts and hard data. Um, you know, this has to do with maybe product knowledge. Um, if you're learning, you know, in one of the orientations that I sat through, we were learning time recording devices and we learned the different models and how they compared to each other and the, how they were repaired, um, that kind of hard, hard principle fact based kind of thing. And then organizational and departmental objectives, um, you know, 
those training objectives orientate toward keeping the employee active, keeping them on the job, keeping them productive, uh, making sure that they're doing things at the at the minimal cost, um, and also you know reducing the turnover and the absenteeism. Um, and, and of course, another objective is the individual performance and growth. I mean, we all want to think that our employers care about you know what you know what we want to do as well professionally. Um, but we have to really look at what impact the training is going to have on the behaviors and attitudes of the person who's receiving the training. Um, we've got to be careful that we provide provide the right information in the right framework. Um, we'll also look at um, what type of growth an individual will have by going through the training. So let's talk about the methods of on-the-job job training, and this is going to this may. Um, relate directly toward your project. There's on-the-job training, uh, job rotation or cross-training, and that basically means that the employee is going to sit down and actually do the job. They're going to be shown how to do the job. They're going to they're going to be monitored the first few times they do the job, and the supervisor is going to be right there with them until they prove that they've mastered the process. And it's great because it allows for a lot of um, flexibility. Um, and doesn't require any special facilities. You can basically train that employee right at their right at their workstation. And the disadvantage of it is that it can be uh, sloppy. Um, the employee may not get all the information that they need, and the training uh, may be interrupted and even negligent in some cases due to the work pressures that are going on uh, with both the trainee and the supervisor right there in the work environment. And we have vestibule training, and that is almost like working in a sim simulator. Um, the system is designed so that the procedures and equipment that you're going to be using on the actual job are set up in a, in a test environment. The advantage of doing it this way is that the trainer can really engage the employee with you know what the proper techniques are, uh, get them orientated toward exactly what the work environment is going to be. But the disadvantage is it's expensive because just think about if you had to set up a model uh, a model workstation for every real workstation that you had that you're, you're duplicating um, your factory setup and that can be very expensive. Um, and then once the employee walks out on the on the plant floor. They may find that that simulator or that vestibule was not set up the way it needed to be to get them fully trained for their job. Then you have apprenticeship programs, um, and these usually occur over a period of time when an employee is learning an occupation or a craft or a trade, and the employee is given an instruction. They're allowed to do the work, and they also build up their experience because apprenticeship programs sometimes can go on from you know from as few as a couple of months to maybe uh, two or three years and then of course you have classroom training where your supervisors or your managers in the company they're going to come in they're going to lecture you they're going to um, provide a venue for discussion they're going to use audiovisual methods um, and computer computer-based training experiential methods and a lot of times this is good when you're talking about uh, technical fields or professional fields, um, even like training, I mean like teaching, or financial advising, or auditing, or anything like that, you know, that might be a very good type of train, you know, those type of jobs may yield themselves very well to classroom training. But regardless of what type of training you're going to put forth, you've got to make sure that you reinforce what they're learning um, in real life. You, you want the training to be meaningful and you want it to directly relate to what they're doing. Now if we're going to have effective learning on part of the person that is actually being trained, we want to make sure that we give them praise and recognition for what they're doing correctly. We want to give them feedback in a constructive way and also receive their feedback as well. We need to set standards for the trainees and measure their performance against these standards. And if there's a repetitive job that needs to be done, then they need to, they need to do that 
over and over and over until you're sure that they have been properly trained and that they're doing it correctly. And also, you have to think about the person who's actually going through the training. And, you know, it may take a little longer to train some employees and um, maybe other employees you can uh, train in a shorter period of time. So now let's talk about management development because that's um, a different uh, type of training altogether. So let's talk about management development because basically what you're trying to do in management development, it's still a training program, but you also want to make sure that you are bringing up managers in your organization that are going to be knowledgeable and empowered to meet the needs and the objectives of the organization. So you're not, in, in management development, you're not going to be getting day by day job specific training. You're going to be getting a higher level training that has more to do with meeting organizational need. And some of the, um, the things that you're going to encounter in management development include things like problem resolution um, and also uh, getting to know how to bring on new business ventures, um, understanding the business threats that are affecting your organization and also you're going to be working off the corporate vision and the mission uh, because face it when you're a, a, you're a manager that's your responsibility to be promoting the company's vision many times in order to be prepared for a particular promotion or development in your career you have to go through some sort of management development program Now, when we're looking at management development, we really need to keep in mind that there is a, a close relationship between the needs assessment of the organization and the objectives in the management development arena. I mean, after all, th let's think about it for a second. Um, why would you be training your managers in any other way? You want your managers to support and work toward the organizational goals. So you're going to look at the ind individual needs of the man uh, managers in the context of the present job that they're working and to check and see what needs to happen in order for them to perform on the present job and you're going to you're going to pair that with the organizational objectives and you're going to train to that so that um, you work the present job requirements and the future job requirements into an overall management development objective and then from there you come up with individual program individual program objectives so you're gonna let's go over this one more time you're gonna take the needs assessment from the organization you're gonna look at the managers in terms of their present job as well as their future jobs you're gonna determine what type of development needs that they're gonna have you're going to combine all of that information into an overall management development plan uh, um, objective and then you're going to then from that point design your individual program objectives now some of the ways that you train managers a little bit different from how you would train regular um, lower level employees um, an understudy assignment is used to develop an individual's capability to fulfill a uh, specific job and that would be done on the job. Um, you might have coaching which is when one person, one manager, one executive, is executive in the company who has more experience is going to work with the developing managers. Job rotation might require that the manager go from one department to another within the same organization to make sure that they're getting a, a well-rounded feel of what's going on in the company and then also by assigning the manager to special product uh, projects and committee assignments uh, you help them learn about a particular subject and all of those things are important when you're developing your man your managers now 
And that includes on-the-job training, and, and it does look a little bit different from your regular employees. But then let's look at off-the-job training. Off-the-job training could include classroom training, lectures, case studies, role-playing, in-basket techniques, business games, and assessment centers. So we can, we can look at a few of those. We already know, we're, we're already too familiar with what classroom training involves. Um, we know what lecturing involves when one person basically holds control of the classroom and transfers information and knowledge. Um, and to a certain extent you need that. I mean, think about the job of a paramedic. Uh, they have a lot of on-the-job training. They're actively rotating into different responsibilities when they're, you know, when they're training for their duties. But um, they spend an awful lot of time in a classroom and lecture-based environment learning the material that they need to know in order to, to um, be able to launch their responsibilities successfully in the field. A lot of times off-the-job training will include case studies. In case studies, uh, you know, most of these, um, from time to time, we can say that most of these things, at least from a business standpoint, have come out of the... The Harvard, business, the Harvard Business School, um, but many companies are starting to use case studies as a way to, to present real and hypothetical situations that could occur on the job uh, to the management person so that they can learn how to think and operate on that level. And it gives, it gives the person, that the, the trainee, we'll call them a trainee from, that's going through this management development program, the ability to analyze and to internalize some of those uh, thought processes. And then we have role playing, and I think most of us are familiar with role playing, where one person might act as the customer and the other person might act as um, the customer service rep or the customer service manager. Um, or you might have role playing between executives and the board. Um, but, you know, the role playing is really important because it really gives you an opportunity to. Um, make sure that you're ready to deal with that other person on a management level. Now, business games, well, let's go back first and talk about in-basket techniques. Um, in-basket techniques simulate realistic situations and they require the trainee to actually answer one manager's mail and telephone calls. Um, you might have to perform some of the duties for that particular manager. In the fire department, you might, uh, you might serve in the capacity as acting captain. Even though the captain is there, the acting captain would be fulfilling those responsibilities just trying to get used to the job. Um, another way that in, ba and, you know, in basket techniques for a manager are very similar to vestibule training for a regular employee. Um, but the good thing about in basket techniques is that that trainee is actually working live um, issues that are coming up across that desk and they still have the support of the manager there to help them out and then of course business games um, that is a game in which there's a particular setting of a company in its environment and then a team of players get together and they try to make decisions that are involving the company operations. And actually, I'm going to be, um, I actually refer to these things as um, business simulators, and I'm actually gonna be incorporating these in later classes, um, in, in my later management classes. But it actually, you know, we would split the class up in a group of maybe four or five people I mean, split the group up into four or five teams, and then the teams would compete against each other uh, based on these business simulators to make the best decisions. And ultimately, the game involves earning points for your good decisions and losing points when you make poor ones. And so there would ultimately be a team of winners in the business uh, in the business class. And then, of course, you have assessment centers, um, and the assessment centers are a little more formal. Actually, they're a lot more formal, uh, but they are uh, put into place to actually evaluate an employee's potential as a manager. Uh, you might even think about them testing for an aptitude for management in a particular department. And through the assessment center, then they would determine the actual manager's needs as far as additional training. 
So if we go back and we look at these management development methods individual, we, we get a look, look, look at understudy assignments. Understudy uh, sounds like a pretty good idea. I mean, basically what you're doing in an understudy situation um, is that you are developing the individual's capabilities to fill a specific job. And that individual who will eventually, that individual will be, will be given that job eventually and will work for that person that they're um, serving as uh, they're serving under as an understudy. Now, the the advantage of it is that um, certainly you're engaged in the training because if you know that you're going to be walking into that job, then you're going to be interested in learning as much as you possibly can about it. Um, you can learn on a practical level, given realistic situations, and at that moment, while you're, you're in that training capacity as an understudy, if something goes wrong, you're not responsible for it. You're not directly responsible for any of the operating results. Now, the disadvantage is, is that if the person who's training you uh, does not have good practices or is not completely aligned with the company mission, then that information is not going to be conveyed to you. So you could be learning from somebody that's training you to do, you know, training you on bad habits. And then of course, if, if an understudy situation goes on a long period of time, it's very, very expensive because you're going to pay your understudy in training and they're going to be paired with another manager. And so it's basically taking two people to do the job of one. Now, if we look at coaching, coaching, you, you have the advantage of still gaining that practical experience and you know, as a trainee, you can see how your decisions are impacting the organization. But on the other hand, um, if the coach is not really engaged in the process, you could end up getting some weak training. Um, and just like in the previous understudy situation, if the coach is not up to date on company policy or doesn't really care about doing things the right way, then you could be learning the wrong thing from the wrong person. Now, if we look at job rotation, job rotation has some good, has some advantages and disadvantages as well. Um, job rotation gives you the advantage of being able to observe the way manage, management principles can be applied in various environments. So you actually, you get to move around the company and you get to see how management is acting in all these different capacities. Um, and it also gives you an opportunity to get familiar with the entire organization. But the problem is, is that while you're in this process of job rotation, there's a very high probability that you're going to be assigned menial tasks, which if you're trying to train and learn more, being assigned marginal responsibilities uh, could be very, very frustrating. And there's always the risk that your training could be interrupted mid-cycle and then you would end up stuck in whatever department the, uh, the training stopped in. Now, when you think of things like special projects, um, the special project is a, is a really good way to train employees because it allows them to learn about a particular project or a particular subject. Um, and it's not just busy. It's not just busy work. There, that work that's going on on these special projects is actually going to end up somewhere and materialize into something. And with the committees, it's kind of the same thing. You know, if you serve on a committee, you're going to learn that topic really well. Your training is going to be intensified in that area. And the individual that works with the committee on its regularly assigned duties and responsibilities will carry that knowledge forward. We won't spend too much time on classroom training. Um, you know, the advantage with um, being in a classroom environment is that you're absolutely committed to what's going on in that room for that period of time. Um, and we're pretty much um, familiar with that. And you can use case studies in a classroom environment and that'll bring a kind of a sense of realism to it. But the, the risk that you run in a classroom situation is that whatever you're talking about, whether it's case studies or decision-making models or whatever, it's going to be a lot simpler than what you're actually going to encounter in the field. So that's kind of a disadvantage. And if you have people that aren't participating, then that's a disadvantage. 
And if your instructor is not knowledgeable in the area, then that can be a real problem as well. So in the classroom environment, um, you can make use of, of lectures and case studies, but they have their limitations as well. So let's look at the um, incident method. And this, uh, this actually goes on a lot with uh, emergency management and organizations such as that. When you're looking at incident methods, um, so what they're basically doing is they're taking a case study and then as that case study materializes then they start making changes to it that force you to change your direction on your on your decisions and change your approaches think about this in an emergency management situation um, you're given an initial initial scenario let's say that that initial addition that initial uh, scenario is a a train wreck where one of the cars might be carrying hydrochloric acid. So that's given as your initial problem to launch your case study and then your group might start its work off on how it would address that problem. And then somewhere in the first 15 or 20 minutes of your discussion after you've started to make some of your decisions um, the instructor might come up to the table and say oh by the way this train derailed um, a mile away from an elementary school. And then all of a sudden you've got to rethink what you're doing, maybe reprioritize some of the things that you're working on, and then come up with a new set of decisions. And this process, at least in emergency management, can go on for three or four hours while you build that skill up of being able to respond to an ever-changing situation. So that's an example of incident method. Then we have the role playing. We talked about the role playing as well as the in basket techniques where the trainee actually does the job of the manager while the manager is sitting there helping. The business games, they're wonderful. They simulate uh, reality. They really make you compete with your other classmates and it really gives you an opportunity to have a lot of feedback to, to some of the decisions that you're making. But, um, you know, in a lot of cases, teams will get so involved with just wanting to win that they forget that they're supposed to be learning specific things from the business game. And when we look at management education, um, that can be academic or it can be seminar based and companies will use both. Um, in the academic environment and in the, uh, the seminar environment, you can get new ideas and strategies and perspectives, um, but you run the same risk as you would in a classroom situation where there might be um, a lack of real world application. So you need to think about that in your management, in management education as well. And then of course, when you look at um, assessment centers, the, you know, the big problem with assessment centers, they're so expensive. So unless you're a company that's going to be in processing hundreds or thousands of employees every month, you might not even want to invest in something like this. Um, you know, when you're dealing with uh, an assessment center, it's really hard for them to cost control. They're dealing with employees from all over the organization. They're really not specializing in any particular department. And the things that you do in the assessment center may not even be truly related to the job that ultimately that you're going to be doing. When you go back and you look at your training program, you're going to evaluate it in terms of um, how many, you know, how many trainees went through the program, either voluntarily or involuntarily, um, whether they were new employees or were they uh, existing employees. You're going to look at what types of things were learned, principles, were there additional principles that were mastered or concepts. Um, did your trainees, when they went back to their department, did they change their behavior? Or did they keep doing the same things over and over and over? And then you want to look at the results overall um, to see if by having training methods in place like this, were the, co were the costs actually reduced and did you have a reduction in turnover? So that concludes the mini lecture on Chapter 12 and that does cover most of the aspects that are covered. Um, thank you very much and I look forward to putting up Chapter 13's lecture um, shortly. Thanks.